one. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Equity Committee for Thursday, November 12th, 2020. In accordance with the mandated direction of the state superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices continue to be closed to the public and non-essential personnel in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's resolution approved at the March 10th, 2020 board meeting and the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent, may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety. Without the physical presence of board members subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, Today's Equity Committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website or on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity, Channel 73, Verizon Files, Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable as well as when requesting decisions on an agenda item. Ms. Armstrong, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Scott. Present. Dr. Hager. Ms. Mack. Present. Ms. Pasteur. Present. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Armstrong, if you could please call the roll call of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. Lisa Williams. Present. Mr. Burke. Present. Are there any other members on the call? Yes, good afternoon. This is Megan Shea. Thank you for having Thank us you. today. And I also have with me um, our director of ELA, Ms. Jennifer Kraft. Good afternoon. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Armstrong. And are there any other board members present? Great, thank you, I didn't, okay, perfect. So um, we will continue um, with um, old business. First item on the agenda is the follow-up on the budget discussion and policy 3111. And for that, I call on Dr. Lisa Williams. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the last uh, Board of Equity Committee meeting, we had a presentation from the Department of Business Services relative to the process whereby we formulate our budget, uh, the, sorry, the Board of Education um, annual budget. And what I was hopeful that we would be able to do today as a follow-up to that conversation is to consider policy zero um, 100 as it relates to the governing policy of that process, which is 3111. Um, the idea is to create an opportunity for us to think about the kinds of recommendations uh, that this body might want to advance through the lens of um, policy revision. Um, I, as I understand it, those conversations are often um, convened in PRC. Um, and so before we move into our next piece of business, uh, the invitation is to look at policy 3111 in light of some of the questions that came up for you with regard to equity and access in our decision-making around the budget process so that we might note some of the things that we would like to recommend, or I'm sorry, that the committee might note some of the things that it would like to recommend for inclusion in, in this particular policy. So with that, I will go on mute and um, solicit your feedback with regard to that intersection between equity um, and this policy. Thank you very much, Dr. Williams. Um, so um, are there any questions or concerns from, um, from any board members? Have you had a chance to review policy 3111 um, and reference cross-reference that with policy 0100? So I can start. Um, 
Dr. Williams, one of the things I wanted to know or I had a question about was in regards to policy uh, 3100, I did not see the word equity or equal distribution of resources or anything mentioned there in that policy. So I wanted to know if we could include that language in that policy, um, something where it says, uh, and I guess I was just thinking like to comply with the board's policy 0100, uh, BCPS is committed to creating a fair and equitable annual budget, um, making sure um, funds are equally distributed system-wide or, or something like that. Um, and then that we could bring that to PRC to have that brought as first reader. Certainly. Um, and my, uh, I just want to reiterate what I thought I heard you lifting up in the way of um, comments so that I might codify your thoughts. Um, one of the things that I think Mr. Saris was helping us to appreciate is that there is not um, an operational definition that is governing um, the idea of an application of an inequity lens from the policy level to the work of, of budget formulation. Um, okay. There are some special groups of students, like our Title I students, like um, our L's. Um, and so I am wondering if what you are suggesting is to have explicit language around equity placed into this policy, um, agnostic of the different groups that are given some special consideration through the uh, process at present. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, and also a definition in there also of what um, operational equity in education would look like. Okay. Um, also a definition as well. I think that would be important to have in there. And then um, the second part, yes. So okay. that we could have a more robust um, policy. Ms. Mack, you're muted. There we go. Um, this will sound like a broken record. I support um, the intention here, but I would like to know how we would measure that. We don't have, a, we do not have the means today to look across any vehicle to, to know that our schools are equally and adequately budgeted. And I keep going back to my request for the information that does provide us with the, I think, seven lines of possible budget, which are Title I, special education add-on, um, per pupil headcount per school. I, I don't have the whole list in front of me. Um, so I guess, Dr. Williams, are we close to getting that data? Because we can talk about ensuring equity, but unless we see the numbers, we have no idea, we have no way of measuring it. Um, so I really can't speak for where we are in the process of um, gathering that information, but certainly what I can do with the feedback that you all are providing is share it with the appropriate offices that would be um, res responsible for gathering it. The other thing that I think that's important to your, your larger point, Ms. Mack, is that the updates in Policy 0100 require that accountability that you're calling for. So um, while last year, at least through the vehicle of 0100, there was no mechanism, that is actually not the case at present. Um, so again, I will advance that concern about how do we ensure accountability, um, and we can certainly start with the met metrics that you placed on the table. So I've got I've gathered those notes. Thank you very much. Of course. And um, thank you very much for that, um, Ms. Mack and um, Dr. Williams for um, following up with that. We will make sure that we bring that back to the committee so that we can um, uh, make sure that we are all aware of that information. Um, I feel a good place to start, as you said, is to make sure that we show that the intention of this board is to make sure, make sure. that we are equitable in our our um, resources and in our schools, and that we are also measuring that in data, as Ms. Max said. I think it's, it's I, I think you can't do one without the other, and I think they work well hand in hand. So, and um, I think we're, we're on the right path. Um, Ms. Pastor, did you have any questions or anything? Okay. Uh, my comment just pretty much dovetailed on what um, on my thinking based on what Ms. Mack just said, that we need to, you know, I'm always big on that context about mm -hmm. um, uh, what are we speaking specifically and measurements. How do we measure that we've been successful 
um, as opposed to just having the language. Uh, and Ms. Ms. Scott, and can just, I? I'm sorry, no, Ms. Mister. I'm just so knowing, sorry. It's okay. And just knowing that under the finances or, or um, looking at budgets, having um, something in the language in terms of going back to context so that we know that there's equity in terms of how the, we are budgeting by office. Does Dr. Williams, do you, are you getting what I'm saying? I'm, because I know I'm not saying this well, but just making sure that when we're looking at equity and attaching it, that we are really attaching the need or processing the needs of children in schools, et cetera, et cetera, uh, so that we are not saying we're going to give this much in this pot when that pot at some point or for some other school might be different. I, and, uh, and of course, I don't know how that language would say, but well, just. Well, uh, no worries. If I could just sort of pull together what I think I heard from the three comments. Um, first, the question of what's the operational definition, which is what Ms. Scott raised, the larger point of how are we defining this. Then Ms. Mack's point about let's look at the different groups of students that we know from the research, they need more support, right? And how are we thinking about these things? And then as we think about offices that support, is there a way to triangulate these ideas so that we have alignment across? Um, and certainly, I think with the um, updates to zero one hundred, this is a really good opportunity for us to get clear in this these ways uh, and to make the policy more precise. So that it is serving our interest in in um, ensuring and being able to know what we know about our work around equity and access, at least through the administration of finances and alignment of supports um, as well. Ms. Smith, yeah. Yeah, what I wanted to point out, and I think it dovetails with what Ms. Pasteur just said, I pulled up the spreadsheet again, and I don't, sure, there are metrics that are pure dollar metrics um, that we want to make sure that money is being spent equally on all of our students, but there are other things, um, other non-instructional type things that impact the quality of a child's educational experience, like the, the um, does one school have 33 kids in a class when another school has 20 kids in a class? So it's the staffing ratios, um, the special education ratios that we just got a had a presentation on school psychologist. Um, just looking at the resources of every school to ensure that those resources, whether they be people or money, are allocated adequately is what I'm talking about. <laughs> And and it, it is not, your ask is not unprecedented in the history of Baltimore County. From my experience, um, a while back, we used to use Z scores. Where we oh, yeah, I remember. Right. So, I mean, we have, a, we have mechanisms where we can think about um, different areas of need and make assignment based on those kinds of statistics. Um, and so certainly we can take these recommendations back to that body for consideration. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. And I would um, also like to say it was something that was brought up um, at the previous meeting um, in regards to what uh, Mr. Sears had said, is that we are equal, but it's not necessarily equitable. And so that did resonate with me. So um, I would like to see if we could have something in the language that could also speak to that. There's a difference between something being equal and, and equitable. And what our goal is, is to be equitable. So um, I would like to um, see that language in there. And then is that something that would then be brought back to this committee where we would review it? And then the next step is that it would go to PRC. So so my interpretation of what should happen as a result <laughs> of this, and I only <laughs> and I only smile because this is a this is a big project and not in a bad way. I mean, in a highly consequential way. Um, is to take the feedback from this body, meet with George Saris and his team, and um, offer that 
that is this is the request that we put together a way of thinking about how we do these things um, that ensures accountability, that has an equity lens on it, that allows us to think broadly about the different things that children need to be successful, and then bring that particular proposal back to this group for a consideration. And then I suspect um, from there, you all would have access to it to, to take it to PRC for recommendation in, in the policy um, of 311, unless there is a better or more responsive uh, policy device. Okay, thank you. Does that that does that sound like reasonable follow up? That uh, that sounds like reasonable follow up. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, and I, I I greatly appreciate um, Ms. Mack and Ms. Pastor's input on this because I greatly value their opinion and um, I think it makes for a more uh, robust. I, my, I, I I do miss uh, uh, Dr. Hager's opinion here and her voice in, in all of this. So. Uh -oh. Yeah, but thank you all. Did anyone else have any um, questions or, or anything else? Um, okay, thank you. Okay, so um, uh, so um, with that, we've concluded our discussion on um, policy 3111. And um, the first item on the agenda for new business is reading by grade three. How do we apply an equity lens to these efforts? And um, for that, again, I call on Dr. Lisa Williams. So my name is here, but this will not be me tonight. Uh, <laughs> Megan Shea and Jennifer Kraft are here to uh, shepherd us through this discussion. And so with that, Megan, I'm going to turn off my mic. Okay, but Dr. Williams, you are always part of our work. So you can uh, turn your mic off, but you're still in this, my friend. Um, I want to start by apologizing. My camera is broken. Um, otherwise, I would turn on my camera so we could be face-to-face. Uh, -face. So I apologize in advance. Um, but many of you have heard me talking about this is an area that I'm um, clearly passionate about. And I really want to thank the members of this committee for inviting us here today. Um, to, to talk about this really important conversation. And, and so what I want to start with is um, with our outcomes. Actually, your committee helped drive our outcomes because I used the um, questions that I received from Dr. Lisa Williams um, in response to the committee's request to, to help us frame our conversation um, so that we could make sure that we were really addressing um, and I know we will have plenty of time um, at the end um, for your questions because um, I think even just witnessing the conversation that you just had, having that discussion is where we really get to the heart of the work. Um, so our presentation this evening um, was guided by, as I said, the, the questions that we had received from the committee. First, addressing how are we approaching our um, expectation and our commitment to ensuring students are reading by grade three. And so I'll talk about our system approach as evidenced in our compass our teaching and learning framework, and, and then also talk um, somewhat about the science and the evidence base that we use for some of the decisions we make around curriculum and professional learning. Um, and then we're going to take a look at some of the data um, to talk about the disparities in reading by grade three, um, by race and by service. And then um, in knowing those disparities that exist, and in some cases, um, and, and really in all cases, are persistent, we're going to end the presentation by really spending some time to talk about our work as a um, ELA office and also as a larger department of academics for intentionally um, integrating culturally responsive pedagogy and curriculum. And so we're going to um, talk about some of the projects and the works that we have going on now and then really just open it for discussion about um, what are some other very specific and intentional ways that we can continue to interrogate uh, the current classroom practices so that we can um, close the gaps and ensure that opportunity for all students. And so the language that I'm sharing right here comes specifically from our compass. As you know, Dr. Williams um, launched our new strategic plan in the compass, um, our path forward. And so within that compass, we do have some key initiatives that really address literacy specifically. So while, of course, I'll always offer that literacy is in everything, these are two areas in the compass that really, to your first question about what are we doing, um, really address our system commitment to literacy. So First on the left, um, as members of the board, you are very aware because it's with your support, um, certainly as part of the budget process and then ongoing conversations, that we've been able to now fully implement and focus this year specifically on the implementation of our open court foundational skills curriculum. 
in all classrooms in kindergarten through grade three. Um, so this has been a long journey to get to this point. And this year is the first year that we have it in all classrooms K to three. So this year we added grade two and grade three for the first time. Um, and I'm gonna talk in a little bit about why that is such a critical step for us as a system uh, for our commitment to ensuring all students are reading by grade three. And then along with that is the strategy about, and I know, um, especially because I spend significant amount of time with Ms. Mack and Ms. Pesture on curriculum committee, I know that they are very um, committed to and aware of the need for that professional learning. So I'm gonna talk about the professional learning that we're providing for teachers, but then also really for our school-based leaders, because so much of what we're gonna talk about for curriculum, um, much of the disparity can sometimes happen um, in the classroom in terms of implementation. So we really wanna ensure that we are building the capacity for our teachers, but also for our school-based leaders, because they really play a critical role in ensuring that fidelity of implementation, but then also in ensuring that we are um, having that critical eye for outcomes to ensure those are positive. And then on the right-hand side, I wanna talk about another area of the compass. Um, that is focused on disciplinary literacy. Um, and so you can see disciplinary literacy is really where we talk about literacy across all of the content areas. So this is where we're focusing on specific areas in elementary, middle, and high school to ensure that we are developing authentic literacies across all of our content areas or content disciplines. This begins though with a strategy on focusing on foundational literacy as well as those early interventions needed to close achievement gaps as soon as possible. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And then we're also going to, as a system, part of our literacy work is around, um, as I said, that cross-discipline framework. But strategy 4C also talks about our commitment to providing the literacy supports and interventions needed for striving readers. It is an ongoing challenge um, that we have to acknowledge as part of our work um, that we have far too many students who are um, going into our upper elementary grades and into middle and high school um, for whom we have failed to provide that solid foundation. And to um, be clear, that is disproportionately impacting our students by race. So our students of color are disproportionately um, showing up in our data as um, being scheduled for reading interventions. And so it's really important that we have uh, multiple approaches and that we take a multifaceted approach to think about what is it that we're doing at the core for our core curriculum and having that solid foundation. But it's equally as important that we're understanding the context and interrogating the practices that are resulting in that disproportionate impact. Um, and that's a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight. And so in our strategic plan, um, that first focus area of learning accountability and results, we do have a teaching and learning framework that was new this year that really spells out our beliefs about teaching and learning in BCPS and our core expectations. And so we pulled out these core beliefs here about teaching and learning because they really speak to how, um, to Dr. Williams' earlier point, that the, the goal of policy um, 0100 with equity is that it is supposed to be integrated fully and clearly evident and intentional in all of our work. And so um, in the efforts to develop the teaching and learning framework, we wanted to be clear about the need to have um, equitable access and instruction that promotes equity for students, including and reflecting of high expectations um, and that cultural significance and uh, relevant and responsive pedagogy. Um, so I wanted to share that while tonight we're going to talk specifically about how that shows up in literacy instruction. Um, this is a part of our new teaching and learning framework, and it was intentional that we ensure that that is true for instruction across all content areas. And so here we have, this is the system definition that we um, had adopted several years ago um, around our work around literacy. And what's really important is to think um, in this um, definition, certainly this idea about across all the disciplines, but it's also really important to think about our continuum of learning. And so um, literacy is something that is developmental and behavioral, but it's also a means to liberation, quite frankly. And so when we think about our equity work 
and our commitment to ensure that all students meet their full potential and demonstrate the um, knowledge and ability to participate in their community, literacy is the key to doing that. And so when we talk tonight about where we are as a system and the steps that we have taken and those that we still need to take um, around this equitable literacy um, initiatives, it's really important that we think about how that is a core component of the definition of literacy to begin with. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about, you've heard me in several other board meetings um, talk about letters training. And so I just wanted to take a moment because this is an important part of our strategy as a system for ensuring that our students can read by grade three. So letters is an acronym that stands for Language Essentials for Teachers of Reading and Spelling. And it is a research-based professional learning um, currently, and there is legislation moving in this direction, um, but currently we know that our new teacher candidates coming from the universities um, with teacher preparation certificates are woefully un underprepared for how to um, effectively teach explicit foundational literacy um, and deliver comprehensive targeted language and literacy instruction for students. And so what we have found over a number of years is that our teacher candidates um, do not have the knowledge themselves um, or the preparation. Much of that was reserved for um, those master's programs or reading specialist cert certifications. And what we know is that these this knowledge of how the brain learns to read um, is part of the preparation for ensuring that students have access to high quality instruction that is explicit and systematic. And I say that it's part of because we are going to talk also about how um, the instruction of literacy, though certainly grounded in evidence and this um, research in neuroscience, it doesn't exist in a vacuum, which is where our need for that culturally responsive pedagogy is so important. But because we've talked about the letters modules before and because that first question is what is the system doing to ensure students can read, I wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit about these modules because what they're really establishing for teachers is how the process of learning to read happens um, to help them understand the complexities because to have that understanding of how the brain acquires um, decoding and encoding and the ability to put words together to form meaning is is a really important step for understanding um, and elevating students um, in the classroom. And so this image, and I'm, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time, although I'm sure you can hear, I, I get excited about this topic, um, but this image of the brain, and, and just to help you understand really the depth of understanding that we're trying to build for teachers through these modules, we're really trying to help teachers understand what is happening in the brain um, that supports reading. And so you can see that there are multiple areas of the brain that have to be involved, major regions of the left hemisphere that perform specific jobs in concert with one another in order for proficient reading to occur. And the reason that's so critical for teachers to develop that understanding is that oftentimes when one or more parts of these processors are not working the way they're intended, we tend to lump that all together and just say things like, she can't read or this student isn't a good reader, but it's much more complex than that. And so what we have to really understand is that uh, reading itself is not something that we are hardwired for, that it really is about um, how the brain processors learn to work in concert with each other. Um, there is plenty of evidence-based research that says that this is true across all races and cultural differences. So some of the science that I'm going to talk about that is the evidence basis for reading instruction is agnostic in terms of the um, brain scans that have been done of children of all different races and cultural backgrounds. And the reason that that's important is to show just one piece of the larger reading instruction process, which is that the evidence base, when we talk about terms like evidence based for reading or scientific based reading programs, um, it's important to know that there have been studies to talk about the universal nature of these brain regions. 
And so here, this graphic talks about those four different processors. And I'm just going to talk really briefly about um, sort of everything that has to come together for proficient reading. So down on the bottom, you'll see two green circles that represent the phonological processor and the orthographic processor. And this basically talks about phonological processor are sounds. So these start from birth when babies are making um, sounds and hearing sounds and beginning to distinguish units of sound. This is what our brain is hardwired for, the phonological processor. And so you know from a very young age, babies begin with making those sounds and hearing those sounds. The orthographic processor is about processing those visual symbols. So we have a letter symbol in our um, English language that we use that is not universal. And so when we start to put symbols to those sounds, to represent those sounds, we're connecting that phonological processor and the orthographic processor for phonics. And I'm sharing this with all of you because this is what we're teaching teachers. So when we bring our teachers together for the letters modules, this is for many, many of our teachers the first time that they are learning this, the first time that they are truly understanding all that has to come together. And the reason that's so important is because when you look at this, after those two processors come together for phonics, then, of course, it's all with the ultimate goal of meaning and context. And that's how we become proficient readers when all four of these processors are working together. Building this understanding of our teachers, of our youngest students, is critically important because it illustrates for our teacher, can our, our newest teachers and our veteran teachers who are in the classrooms all the different complexities, but it also suggests the different options that can contribute to striving readers. And so before, when I talked about students who are having challenges in reading, some of the work that we're doing with teachers and why having a core program like Open Court is so critical is because the evidence base for developing a curriculum like Open Court is based on this neuroscience. But without the professional learning for teachers to understand why that matters, this is where teachers' behaviors or student behaviors play far too big a role in determining who is ready to read and who isn't. And so when we think about um, the instruction of reading, yes, there is a science basis. And I'm thinking, Ms. Scott, a few minutes ago when you talked about the difference between equal and equitable. The idea of equal, so there are parts of the learning to read that are going to be the same from a neurological perspective. And that's some of what I've talked about. And it's what a packaged curriculum like Open Court is going to be based upon on that evidence based science. The part that then we have to think about in a truly equitable approach to literacy is to understand that the classroom is a social environment and it doesn't happen void of the context of race and of our students' identity. And so that's where we have to really dig in. So yes, we have a core phonics program that is based on this neuroscience and what we have learned over decades really of research, but how does that fit into a larger context? And so what this image shows is that our brain patterns can respond. When we have explicit and systematic instruction, we can actually change the patterns of brain functioning to help remediate readers who are striving. And that's a really important part for our teachers to understand um, and for us to lean in on. Because when we think about instruction, we have to think about what that looks like. And so I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Kraft so she can talk more about that first question about what are we doing and talk specifically about instruction. But I'm going to come back in a little bit to talk about those disparities in race. And so I'm hoping that you'll keep in mind what I just shared with you about that brain research and science because of how it's contributing to how we have to significantly interrogate the disparities that we're seeing in achievement. So Ms. Kraft. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Good afternoon, everyone. So I know that as Ms. Shea said, you know a lot about open court and certainly um, helping to get the funding, but um, just uh, to preface this slide with that open court is that research-based curriculum grounded in systematic explicit instruction of phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, and word knowledge. And so in the 2018-2019 school year, uh, for a small group of schools, we field tested open court with teachers and students in grades K to three. Based on how that went, the decision was made in 2019 and 2020 that we would do a district-wide pilot of open court for grades K and 1. And our grades 2 to 5 followed a phonics and word study curriculum. 
Um, and then this year, we continued um, the pilot of open court for grades two and three. So at this point, grades K through three are all um, using open court um, as part of the research-based curriculum about what we know about the science of learning to read. So to teach and reading is a complex process that incorporates decades of research on how students learn and how reading should be taught. And as you can see here, there's a clear progression of skills that are being taught so that students are building the necessary skills that they need to become increasingly strategic readers by grade three. Uh, additionally, we do have in grades four and five a continuation that we have written so that the instruction does not stop in grade three. Next slide. So I want, it's important to note that this year the Ready to Read Act uh, went into effect. Um, and what the Ready to Read Act, uh, Senate Bill 734, uh, is called it's Students with Reading Difficulties, Screenings, and Interventions. And so the idea is that students need to be screened at the beginning of the school year to determine if they are at risk for reading difficulties. And the exact bill talks about that all kindergarten students should be screened, as well as first graders that were not screened in kindergarten, and any students that are new to our district. And if the screening results indicate a student is at risk, that supplemental reading instruction will be, provide, uh, will be provided to the student, and we also need to document that. And so this year we are um, implementing Dibbles in response to the Ready to Read Act, and we um, purchased it for all students in grades K and 1. Um, they had from October 1st through 31st to administer. Um, because of some difficulties, we're still finishing up the last week of testing because we needed to give some extensions. Uh, so we'll have that data really soon. Um, and we're using an online data system so that we can start to look at um, where we might need to provide some more support um, to schools. Next slide. Uh, so what you see here, and I know um, Ms. Shea has uh, shown this to you a lot, um, but it's still one of my favorites. So this diagram by Hollis Scarborough shows how all of the components are related. So the first component is language comprehension. Uh, the second component is word recognition. Um, and word recognition is going to include phonemic awareness, decoding, spelling, sight recognition. Um, and that idea of sight recognition is the automatic recognition of words and patterns that enable students to read fluently. And then the third piece is through effective instruction and ample practice, students become increasingly strategic and automatic in reading, leading to skilled reading with fluency and comprehension. And so what we really want to be able to see is by uh, grade two that students are starting to put these pieces together. And by grade three, we've really developed skilled readers that are able to use the foundational skills that have been laid to be strategic and skilled readers in all content areas as they move forward. So when we start to think about how do we develop school skilled readers, um, something really important to address is what are those best practices for small group instruction when we select text? So we want to think about what are the benefits of small group instruction? How should students be grouped? What type of text should be used? And really, what's more appropriate for small group instruction versus independent reading? Because effective reading instruction requires teaching two types of competencies, both foundational reading skills and knowledge-based competencies. And skilled readers have both solid foundational reading skills that allow them to translate written words to spoken language and the ability to make meaning from what they read. And so then teachers need to make a decision, how am I going to group my students? Next slide. So by using small group instruction, uh, teachers are able to personalize instruction by checking for understanding, reinforcing skills presented in whole groups, and maybe changing the pace of a lesson or providing additional scaffolds. There's also the benefit of being able to provide immediate feedback to students that is specific and individualized at the time of need. Additionally, it allows a teacher to reteach or pre-teach additional teaching and practice to build prerequisite knowledge and skills. And there's also the element of building confidence through confidence through that collaboration so that there's a safe and comfortable environment for students who might not otherwise participate. And so those are some of those benefits. So the next thing the teacher needs to consider is how should the students be grouped? And they really should be grouped based on frequent ongoing progress monitoring 
um, and the use of data, whether it's formative or formal data. And then students should be grouped based on targeted skills. So you should be thinking, is this a phonemic awareness skill or phonics? Is it vocabulary, fluency, or comprehension? But one thing that is for sure that we have definitely communicated to schools is that they should not be grouped based on a level. Students should always be grouped based on the need. Next slide. So then we have different types of text. We have decodable text, we have level text, we have authentic literature, um, sometimes referred to as complex text. And there is a place for all of them. So a decodable text, their instructional purpose is really to apply that taught phonics skills in a context. It will also help improve sentence reading fluency. A level text, um, is used really when a student is going to be independent without the teacher. And that will help to increase oral reading fluency, increase comprehension, and expand background knowledge on specific text. But most of the time, we want students spending their time when they're with the teacher in complex text. And there are many benefits, including increased motivation. It helps to develop vocabulary and increase comprehension. It promotes joy and pleasure of reading. It increases reading fluency and it helps to transfer classroom learning to real life. Next slide. So um, this quote, level text lead to leveled lives, came from Dr. Alfred Tatum, who's the Dean of the College of Education at the University of Illinois, Chicago. And he said this at the 2013 Michigan Reading Association Conference. And it definitely provided a lot of cognitive dissonance for educators that had been using leveled text as the primary source of small group instruction. And what they um, have found is that focusing solely on simple below level text won't teach readers how to deal with complicated concepts, syntax, or subtle cohesive links in text. Simple texts lack the critical rich vocabulary knowledge only available to students reading complex on grade level text. And so it's very important that we do provide that opportunity to every student. And so sometimes teachers limit the opportunities that students have by only giving them level text. And so um, before, actually, let me go back for one second, because when we're thinking about um, inequities that exist, we have to first begin to think about those inequities in access. So what Ms. Kraft was just offering is an area that we really need to continue to interrogate in our practice, because it's important for um, part of what we were just trying to illustrate is that there are many facets of reading. Um, every time I go through this information and every time I share it with teachers, it becomes more and more apparent just how complex a process it is. And there is a time and a place for all different types of that explicit instruction. Instruction. So we need that explicit and systematic instruction and in foundational skills, which is where Open Court helps us. But we also need opportunities to apply that decoding in text. And so we're going to talk about some specific ways that we can ensure culturally responsive pedagogy is applied to the choosing of text and representation. But it's also important that part of it is around the equitable access. So who in the classroom is having access to complex grade level text? Because because all students need it. Some students do need time with level text as a method for helping to build that independence and fluency, as Ms. Kraft said. But here, the important part in this quote, too, is this idea of solely. If that is the only opportunity students have for text, if they're never able to access that complex text with rich vocabulary and critical thinking, then we are denying equitable access to the instruction that they need to be successful. And so as I transition, your second question was really about disparities in data. So the first thing I wanted to show you was the aggregate data. And so this data is from 1819 because, of course, as you know, we did not take um, the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program or MCAP last year due to COVID. So this is the, the most current data that we have. And so clearly um, what is very evident is that we are not doing well overall, that we are falling sh significantly short of our goal to ensure that all grade three students are successful. 
And so obviously this data reflects the need for us to do things at that system level when we think about what are some of those significant overhauls. And so this represents grade three because that was the question about grade three. And so what we believe is that our efforts to put in place a systematic and explicit program of high quality evidence-based instructional materials for foundational skills will be a systemic approach to changing this data for all students. But we know that that alone is not enough because based on everything I've shared to this point and Ms. Kraft has shared about how the brain learns to read and neuroscience, while certainly we clearly have a lot of work to do um, overall with students, this slide demonstrates that data further disaggregated by race. And so what we see here are the disparities across races are significant. And so while that first data slide demonstrated that as a system as a whole, we have a significant amount of work to do, this data shows that despite the fact that we've proven and the evidence um, from research proves that there is no difference in the neurobiology and this process is the same, we have to continue to interrogate why the data continue to show that we have significant disparities by race. And some of those other areas of reading come into play when we think about the inequity of access and the opportunities to access complex text or the over-identification for intervention programs prior to students having that explicit core solid foundational instruction, then that is a part of what we have to continue to interrogate and disrupt. This data, and I want to be clear that I'm shifting data sources, but for intention. So the data I was just showing is the MCAP data, which is the assessment that's given beginning in grade three. And MCAP is measuring um, skills that involve all of literacy. So it involves um, meaningful decoding of text, but to be able to make meaning. Students are assessed through comprehension opportunities in answering selected response questions and extended response questions. Um, and as they go into the intermediate grades, they begin to use interdisciplinary text. So before when I was talking about that multifaceted approach for phonics and for comprehension, both of those are measured on the MCAP. In um, the reason that here I'm switching to MAP data, which is the measures of academic progress, is because we do not have data for MCAP for grades K through two. And so this slide represents an aggregate um, from kindergarten through grade five. And so what's important to note is that these gaps and disparities um, in outcomes for students by race um, are persistent across the grade levels and in some cases are widening. What's also important to note, and you can see there's an inset there to talk about those same disparities um, by service group. And the reason that they're set off as an inset is, of course, because we know that there's an intersectionality. So we didn't want to represent these all on the same axis, um, but to show that we continue to have groups of students who um, have been underserved in the instructional program that we're offering. And so this map data shows the percentage of students in each group who are at or above that 61st percentile. Um, and so you can see over a number of years, those gaps and um, those disparities in performance are persistent and in some cases widening. And so as we transition to the third question around what are we doing? What are we doing to ensure not only what are we doing for all students, because clearly our aggregate data says that we have a significant amount of work to do in that area, but more importantly, and, and really the, the, the rest of the focus of our conversation and presentation tonight is about this commitment um, from Policy Zero 100 about prioritizing educational equity um, that we believe is a system that di disparities such as these based on race are unacceptable. And so we have to be really deliberate and intentional and explicit about what we're going to do um, to interrogate those disparities and to disrupt them instructionally. And so I'm going to turn it back to Ms. Kraft so that she can talk more specifically about culturally responsive instruction and how that shows up in literacy classrooms and in the work that we're doing with curriculum and with professional learning. So just to level set uh, the um, definition um, for BCPS that we're, we've adopted for culturally re responsive instruction is pedagogy that empowers students intellectually, socially, emotionally, and politically by using cultural reference to impart 
knowledge, skills, and attitudes by Labs and Builds. And so in the next slides, what we're going to do is talk about, we're going to pull out some of those pieces of culturally responsive instruction and talk about how that relates to our English language arts curriculum. So when we talk about positive perspective on parents and families, we talk about the ways that we communicate with families and are they multi and varied? Um, are there multiple entry points as options for parents to participate in and support student learning, recognizing that there's a wide variety um, of different ways that that can occur. Uh, additionally, there should be communication of high expectations. So there should be high expectations for all students. There should be models of various responses that meet the criteria. So there's not just one way um, to do something. Um, and that there really is this inquiry model that educators can adjust instruction to provide equitable access and opportunity for all students to achieve high academic outcomes. So really thinking about those multiple pathways, but still having the same high expectations. Um, just understanding that learning does occur within the context of culture, and we can't separate that. And so that teachers understand the importance of representation and promoting student identities by intentionally selecting curriculum resources and materials, by knowing the students that are sitting in front of them. And so while we might offer choices of several texts within the curriculum, that they make those decisions based on the students they're serving uh, in front of them. Uh, in addition, teachers will demonstrate knowledge of individual student learning needs when planning and implementing instruction. And so that they have that at the center of what they're doing, that it's not just this is day four, so I'm going to teach this lesson as written, but really knowing who their students are when they uh, plan the lesson. Um, and then, Michelle? Okay. No, I was just no, going to chime in and say that part of being culturally responsive, too, is um, to center that. So we know that we currently have a workforce that is primarily comprised of white, mostly female educators. And so if we don't um, intentionally interrogate this idea of instruction happening in that social construct, we can fall into the trap of thinking that fidelity of implementation or a scripted mm -hmm. phonics program, um, this doesn't apply. And that would be a mistake because learning is by nature a social endeavor. And so it's yes. really important that not only do we understand our students, but that we're centering that in the choices that we're making instructionally, even within the context of this evidence-based scripted program. Yeah, Ms. Shea, do you want to share about your experience uh, the other day of going in and seeing a phonics lesson? Because sure. I think that would be a great example. Yeah, and I'm going to skip past some of this just as we're of doing course. that. These yes. are just some examples from the curriculum. But um, yeah, so a perfect example is I had visited a third grade phonics classroom and the teacher was um, a white teacher teaching a classroom predominantly of students of color. And the teacher was following with fidelity the implementation and the skill was talking about a particular syllable type and a particular um, spelling pattern. And so so that part is the part, to use Ms. Scott, your words before, about equal. I would expect that skill to be taught in third grade classrooms across the system because the science basis is about that sequence and how we build on those skills. But the teacher, in doing so, had chosen a word for the students that had no meaning or relevance for the community of students. And I know that I'm going to, I knew I was going to blank on the word, but um, the, the teacher was following trip. a sound spelling pattern trip. And the student Students, that wasn't the way that they were familiar with talking about that. And so the lesson sort of came to a standstill because the teacher wasn't thinking about the cultural reference or relevance for the community of students. So it's just one example about if the purpose of teaching decoding is to make meaning and you're trying to be culturally responsive, how can we help teachers um, always have that as the lens that they're centering in the instructional decisions that they're making? And so these are three more categories or characteristics, if you will, of culturally responsive instruction. So I'll let Ms. Kraft talk a little bit about what that has to do with literacy instruction in terms of our efforts to be more culturally responsive. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that no reading program, legislative mandate, high stakes tests can ever replace the power and influence that a teacher possesses to improve student achievement. So when teachers embrace culturally responsive literacy instruction, that will serve as a catalyst for improved reading achievement among students who are culturally and linguistically diverse. And so what we've done is we've looked at these different areas and said, you know, where do we provide these opportunities so that teachers can be reflective in their practices, that you're not just opening 
up the curriculum and, and teaching a lesson, but that you're actually being reflective in what you're doing. And so thinking about uh, it through the lens of culturally mediated instruction. So really building on students' knowledge and experiences, reshaping the curriculum so the curriculum is written, but that you have to then shape it for the students that are in front of you. And then also just understanding that the teacher is the facilitator and that they are going to be the, the one in the classroom that is able to create and sustain a safe and welcoming and supportive classroom environment for all of the students in the classroom. So in response to um, really thinking about our data and the students that we're serving or not serving, uh, one of the things that we're going to do is a culturally responsive ELA audit. And so as some of you might remember, right now we are being audited by MSDE, as are all the districts in Maryland. Um, uh, around our English language arts curriculum. But within that curriculum audit, they were not looking specifically at the cultural responsiveness of the curriculum. And so um, our K-12 um, department is really looking at our curriculum through that lens. So we will take the results from MSDE, and then we're gonna conduct our own audit to say, is our curriculum culturally responsive? And so I've just included three examples from the rubric that we've created to start looking through, and these all come from the teacher materials part, but there's also a part for text, and there's also a part for task. And so we will be looking at our curriculum to ensure that we're what we're putting in front of teachers, and then what teachers are putting in front of students is culturally responsive and understands that learning is social in nature. So with that, I know we wanted to make sure we had time for you to ask um, your questions and to um, anything we need to clarify or anything further for discussion. Like I said, um, we're grateful that we had the time to come talk um, specifically about what we've done so far, what we're doing right now, and, and certainly to be clear about all the work that's still left to do. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to the committee. And thank you. Great. Thank you so much for coming. And that presentation was um, eye-opening and, and, and very informative. Um, so I, I definitely appreciate you um, you all sharing that um, very um, pertinent information with the committee. Um, I guess um, we can start with our um, committee members. Um, if there's any questions, it looks like uh, Ms. Pastor, you have a question. You can go ahead and go first. Thank you very much. That was cool. <laughs> um, Cheryl, yeah. you're you're breaking up a little bit. Okay. okay. Thank you. Oh, you're that's better. better. That's better. Yes. All righty. Um, uh, again, thank you. Uh, as I want to just, I have so many questions. So let me just start with um, with. Okay, forget that. I want to start with the, the professional development. Yeah. Uh, for um, teachers with it. Uh, and I'm going to connect it uh, um, with group work, mm -hmm. just as an example. Um, and and you, you put the, this does not mean, uh, because we want to develop the skills for the children. We want to be able to move them, but we also, in the classroom setting, don't want them to feel less than, if, if, if you will. Uh, what do we do? Is this in school or do, is the system doing something? What are we doing to better reach out to our, our young people through their teachers and working with their teachers? Because certainly, and I know we'll get to the numbers, we're going to, we'll, we'll look at the numbers so we see that with all that you have there, there are clearly something, a lot of things that we do correctly but there are also clearly some things that um, um, we're not. And there are a lot of programs out there that help teachers. Um, Ms. Dr. Williams will probably remember um, back several years ago when we did TESA, Teaching Expectation and Student Achievement, and JESA, um, Gender, um, and, and help teachers to process how they work with students, whether it's whole class or in groups, or uh, and and what they're looking at, um, and and it was an eye opener for them. So what are we doing now? Uh, because we have the bells and whistles, but what do we do to help teachers process themselves to look inwardly? Mm -hmm. 
and to see what it is that they're doing, especially with reading and writing and speaking, all of them going together. So I think, as always, that's a great question, Ms. Pastor. Um, so I can talk a little bit about, I, I think that the, the question about really self-reflection is a really good one, because I think um, asking teachers to reflect on, and really, um, for too long, we've accepted these disparities as predictable, and, and we've sort of not reflected on our role as a teacher in, you know, those data are a symptom. The, the data that we often look to, and, and I, I want to be, you know, honest with you that I think too often we don't necessarily think about what's my role in that um, because I'm not necessarily seeing the outcome disparities as a symptom um, of a larger issue in instruction. What I can offer in terms of how are we trying to support that, there's a couple things. One is that um, part of our approach for professional learning support that we shifted in the last two years, you've heard us talk about something called the residency model. We used to do support from central office more like, um, and you probably remember remember from your days as a principal, more like a hotel concierge. If you wanted help, you would call us, we'd come out and we had sort of a menu of presentations that we would offer. And part of what was wrong with that was that it was not specific to the community of students that you were serving. And it was not reflective of your leadership or your teacher's experience or reflective of their practices. And so we've shifted that model so that the residency model is really about um, becoming a part of that teacher's classroom and being able to be that coach to help guide some of that reflection and help the teacher see how his, her, or their instructional decisions um, really are the inputs that can make the difference in some of these um, data outputs. The other piece that I would offer is that um, we had, um, you may be familiar with the Striving Readers Grant that we got several years ago from MSDE. And part of the approach for elementary um, schools in particular was around instructional coaching, around instructional decision making. So it was teaching teachers how to put all this knowledge together and be in that moment in a classroom, listening to four or five students read and being able to make those decisions that are about centering their students listening to children read, seeing those behavior patterns, and then reflecting on how every choice they make as a teacher is going to have an outcome that's either going to improve reading outcomes for kids or potentially make that harder. Um, so those are two areas of professional learning, but I will offer it's something that I think we have to continue to offer those opportunities for reflection for teachers to see that connection. And then I also wanted to say really quickly, because you mentioned about the student voice we have been much more deliberate in the last two years um, about talking to students, um, asking them. Sometimes it's about text choices. What do you want to read? What do you not want to read? What do you want to write about? What do you care about? Because when we talk about relevance, sometimes it's a lot of adults making decisions about what they believe is relevant for kids, and, and that's not going to work. Um, but we've also been talking to students um, most recently in our secondary schools that are in reading intervention classes, because when you talk about students who have really been given a message for a really long time that they are the problem or that there is something wrong with them, this is a group we really need to lean in on because um, they, and, and in many cases, what the students, we were just having this conversation the other day about um, a group of students at Deep Creek Middle. Um, what what we're what they're telling us is that, you know, they for too long they they thought they were stupid or they thought that there was something inherently unteachable about them. And so they would often say about themselves, like, I can't read. I'm not a reader. And and what we know is that's not true. And what we also know is that if we can build on their funds of knowledge, right? Okay, you may not know this, but you know plenty. And you you can think like a 12-year-old and, and respond like a 13-year-old. I'm just going to help you reprogram, if you will, um, how those sound symbols come together. I think that those le that level of listening to students who are in these positions telling us of what did we miss, what did we not do. Oftentimes they talk to us about um, 
you never gave me anything I wanted to read. <laughs> you, you, I've had students tell me you ruined a book because you dragged it out for seven weeks and you should have just let me read it. You didn't give me a choice. You didn't, you know, so I will say that we're being a lot more deliberate about asking kids and, and really listening to our students because I think um, when we make decisions about what we think is best for students without involving them in that process, I think sometimes we, we miss the mark. So those are just a few things I can offer. Um, certainly, there's a lot more we have to do. Okay, I'm good. I'll I'll stop there. Um, thank you. Thank you, Miss Bester. Thank you, and um, Miss Mack, you had your hand raised. I did. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to say thank you. Um, I, I find this whole subject fascinating. I could listen to it time in and time out. And I also <laughs> so want to apologize know. because. Um, uh, some of my questions are going to be tough questions, but they're coming from my concern about sure. how basic needing to read is. Um, we received an email, all of us, from Decoding Dyslexia mm -hmm. that said 95% of students are cognitively capable of learning to read. And I know I fixate on the 37.3% in third grade. And if I looked across grade level and saw that there was improvement, I would feel better. But by sixth grade, we're down to 31.7%, and I'm talking about all students. By 10th grade, we're at 33.6% of students reading on grade level. So we are essentially pushing kids through school without the most basic foundation for success. And I don't think it's any coincidence that, and I think, Ms. Shea, you talked about the fact that you know, reading is reading, but it also is essential to be successful in other classes. Sure. In um, seventh grade math, um, only 9.3% of our kids are proficient in math, and fewer than 5% of our African American students are proficient in math. So I, I think there's a correlation between 31.7% of sixth graders being proficient in reading, and then because I know that you know they have to read problems. They have to read the words Correct. to be able to solve the problems. And I've said this t many times. We could have students who are inherently brilliant in math, but because they need to be able to read to do math the way we yep. teach it, we'll never know that. So I have grave concerns about the fact that we have pipelines of students who don't have the most basic foundations to be successful in school. And I know that policy 0100 requires that students be able to read by second grade. 70% of our kids aren't reading by third grade, and it only gets worse as the years go on. Um, I know you guys are, uh, you, you've admitted it, you're working on it, but we have kids who are going to graduate and they can't read. I taught those kids. And I know we're too, we have tutoring money and we're doing all that, but we're going to throw kids to the wolves soon who cannot read. They're not going to be well employed. They're going to have mundane jobs, and I am concerned about them. Um, and maybe I'm preaching to the choir here, but, you know, other school systems, um, Montgomery County, 50.5% of their kids by third grade are reading on grade level. Howard County, 55.6. Our kids are behind the eight ball, mm -hmm. and I, it, it worries me. It actually keeps me up at night, and I don't think that we're going to be able to catch them up. As I ask in the board meeting, I think last week, or I don't even know when it was, it, um, earlier this week, rather, or maybe it was the last meeting, <laughs> when you are taking a 10th grader, trying to give that 10th grader remediation in the basic foundations of reading, when does the 10th grader ever get 10th grade subject matter? I, I sure. just, I'm just very worried. I know there's not any simple answer to that, but I just, it, it worries me. If you can't read, right. you can't do anything. Right. So, so Ms. Mack, I want to start by saying you don't have to apologize for asking tough questions because that, first of all, that's your job, right? To, to, to hold us accountable and make sure we're thinking about it. But also you, I think you use the phrase preaching to the choir. I'm also up at night thinking about this, as is my whole team, as I know you know, is Dr. McComas and, and Ms. Craft. I will just a quick shout out. I stole Ms. Craft from Montgomery County so that she can help me. Um, well, there you go. Good. Way, right. <laughs> so um, 
I should say, recruited and begged. Um, so, so we're very well aware of where we fall in relation to um, other districts. We feel just as passionate about the disservice that we're doing to our students, and we feel incredibly passionate about the role literacy plays in everything. You are spot on that our math data and our science data and our American government data is continuing to, as is our SAT data. We have multiple data points that all point to the same issues in literacy. Um, and, and it's true for our CTE students, that technical state, skill attainment, those technical manuals require a tremendous amount of literacy to be successful. So, so you know, all, all I can say to you is that there is no one simple answer. This is not for a lack of awareness of the gravity of the situation. Um, I hope I continue to communicate the sense of urgency that we feel um, around the, the multiple facets of this work. And I think that there are multiple because I think, you know, and, and one of the things that I think is really important, so the students that are in high school, we have far too many students, way more than what would statistically be acceptable as needing reading intervention. Um, we often talk about that's a failure of curriculum. When your pyramid, if you will, that decoding dyslexia referenced in their email is on its head, as ours is, where you have far too many students, you have to interrogate the systems. You have to start thinking about the curriculum and the pedagogy and the instruction because you cannot problematize the students at that point. It's too pervasive for us not to do that. Um, and I also and, and can I just be clear that please. nothing I ever says problematizes students. Right. I, 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 you know, 95% no, are capable of learning. This is not a student issue for me. Right other than the fact that the students are the victims. Right, ag agreed. Well, because when we're looking at um, outcome data, it's also reflecting a lack of access. And so what, what I wanna um, really lean in on that you share that I think is so important, um, it is so much more difficult, and the research would support this, to intervene in the life of a 10th grade student. Um, it becomes so much more challenging, and the damage that that is doing in terms of their ability to be successful in other content areas is huge. Um, there's plenty of statistics about uh, literacy rates in um, juvenile um justice um, situations and dropout rates and, and you name it. So, so we're really clear that the um, impact of that is, which is why it's so critical that we do a better job um, foundationally and why we were trying to illustrate that our solution has to come with what are we doing right now for the kids who we have failed to provide that, um, who are in high school, which is where some of those secondary and adolescent literacy supports come into play. But also equally as important is what are we doing differently foundationally so that those numbers are more reflective of those statistics because that's where then it becomes really about intervening for students. What we've got right now are, are data that are telling us that our core is not solid. Our found, we're, we're built on right. a shaky foundation. And so I, I know that's not giving you, I, I don't have a quick answer. I, I certainly wish that I did, but I, I wanna just be clear that, that I am um, absolutely with you on the urgency of the problem and the need to demand that we do better um, because th our kids deserve that. Ms. Shea, I'd like to follow up just one and make sure. one point. Um, since I've been on the board, I have people telling me all the time that retention is not a strategy. Mm. I found an article, um, a study done by Harvard Graduate School of Education um, that and says, con Florida. Mm -hmm. yes, contrary to critics' fears, repeating third grade does not reduce students' chances of completing high school. In fact, it improves their pre preparedness for high school and their performance while enrolled. I'm not advocating that as a primary strategy, but I think at some point when we keep pushing kids from third grade to fourth grade to fifth grade and they never ever have that foundational skills, we are contributing as a school system to their lifelong failure in many subjects. And I don't know what that answer is. That's way above my expertise. It's way above any reading I've done. But I can say this, we need to start thinking outside of the box because what we're doing now is not working. Yeah, so let me uh, add to the conversation. Um, so thank you, Ms. Mack, and thank you, Ms. Shea and Ms. Kraft. Uh, Ms. Mack, I, I think one of the important things for us to, to work through as a community around changing our outcomes, and believe me, we too are um, desperately uh, driven to change its outcomes. I lose sleep at night, just as you do. Um, and, and I, like Ms. Shea, I don't ever mind you asking tough questions, 
I just ask that the tone recognize I am not the enemy <laughs> and nor are we lazy and doing nothing. Um, that we are the choir who is right there with you crusading to change the outcomes. As I know you know we are, but um, I think what's really important where I believe we fail is not um, allowing students to move forward, right? Where we fail as a system is we do not provide year-round wraparound supports. And as a mother of a child who was a striving reader, right, I would have been outraged if someone said to me, well, you know, your child has to stay behind, right? No, what my child doesn't need is to stay behind. What my child needs is continuous support, right, to accelerate, not to be held back, but we accelerate by providing that continuous on-ramp and support. And I think that that, when, when Ms. Mack, when we talk about thinking outside the box, that's where we need to be thinking. We need to be thinking about some students need longer time to develop those skills, longer practice opportunities, more um, touch points around coaching and support. In our traditional, I think part of what we struggle with is our traditional model of schooling is a factory model, right? There are these arbitrary chunks, first grade, second grade, third grade, right? And we want to move you along like a factory. Mm -hmm. um, but the human brain doesn't develop like a factory, right? Like we're not, we're not widgets. And so I think our challenge here, and this is also part of where the cultural proficiency comes in, right? Because what we really need to do to change outcomes is we really need to truly tailor instruction. And that means some people, some of our children will need continuous support, right? And I'm not saying they don't get a break for summer, but maybe summer needs to be configured differently for students so that they're not held back, that they're able to continue to move forward and then gain momentum and accelerate. Some of our students may need less. You know, we have gifted learners who, who speed right along, and yet we, you know, we, we mm -hmm. kind of keep them in that factory model. So I agree with you that we need to think outside the box. And I, I would propose that we think not about um, reinforcing these, you know, models of factory instruction that are well over 100 years. I mean, these our systems were designed back when education was not mandatory for all. It was, it was really for the privileged, right? And so as more and more people have access um, to it, what we find more and more is that our factory does not fit. <laughs> and so I'll, I'll get off my soapbox, but I just offer that because I know how passionate we all of us in this meeting are. Um, and I, I, I often... Um, lament the constraints of our factory model in a lot of ways because I see it failing so many, many, many of our students and underserving our professionals as well because our professionals too are trapped in this mindset of go or no go when learning is continuous. It's, it's not like uh, I, I, I succeed or I fail. I just haven't learned it yet. I need more time. I need more support. So, Mary, could you, you mind if I... Do you want to take a second just to speak to the idea of retention, too? If you could say your name, is that Mr. Burke? Yes, it is. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I'm sorry I forgot. This is Mr. Burke speaking. Um, Thank you. I just want to speak to reten this idea of retention because people often think, people not in, um, in, involved in the organization often think, well, if somebody doesn't pass a grade, the response should be retention. And, and there's very little research that shows retention by itself works. If you take a child, and, and the reason why this is important for me is I spent the early part of my career teaching first and second grade. So it was all about teaching kids to learn to read. You know, the motto was up to second grade, you learn to read. And then after second grade, you read to learn. And so retention, um, only works if when you keep the child back another year, you have something new to do with them. You have a different program to put them in. And unfortunately, what happens more often than not is people think, well, they didn't do well in first grade, so I'll just put them back in first grade again because they need more time. And most of the time, they didn't, they didn't not learn because they needed more time. They didn't not learn because their brain processes in a different way than their traditional methods. And so the method needs to change. And 
the point of Megan and uh, Jen's presentation today was really about our teachers not understanding the need to change the method because they didn't learn enough about teaching reading in order to do that. And so I just want us to be thoughtful when we use the word, you know, when a kid fails a grade or fails a class, that we should just make them do it again or we should retain them. The conversation so much more complex than just holding the kid back and giving them another year to do that. I just wanted to make sure that was part of the conversation. Thank you. Ms. Scott, can I just- Thank you so much for that, Mr. Berg. Um, I appreciate you giving that um, clarification. Um, Ms. Pastor, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, yeah no, I have a comment. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Burke, um, for that. And you're saying all of these things. I want to go back to the word I used of reflection. So it's clear because it goes to retention. And I think the teachers should just think about themselves and what they're doing. In reflection, they should also be thinking about their children and all of the things that the children bring to school. Some of it's cultural, some of it's economic, um, whatever. So reflecting to see that big picture, because not only do children uh, not mature, the brain or the skills not mature at the same level, all of our children uh, do not come to school coming from the same home life, um, the same experiences. So, when, and, and that goes to retention. Mr. Burke is correct, and this is what we, we've done, is you retain them and you give them a, a, the same. You might change the teacher, but you give them what they did, the same thing they had the first time. And that might not have been the problem. It might not have been about skills. It could have been about what's going on in their lives. It could have been about a number of things, and under other circumstances, they move quicker and they even grasp what they didn't get the first time, plus what they're getting now um, faster. So reflection is about an opportunities and just saying this to teachers and parents and administrators over and over, taking a look at our children. It's the whole child that we have in front of us, not bits and pieces. And I recognize, because I was in the classroom for 2,465 years, that it is difficult sometimes, especially when you have a lot of people in the class, to try to get into those children and understand that. But it really um, does make a difference. And so this is why I'd love to hear what Ms. Kraft brings since we recruited her from Montgomery <laughs> County. Um, what work. she sees as someone coming in that was handled in Montgomery County that possibly we're not doing here. It's no need in having her other than I'm sure she's brilliant and offers <laughs> um, much to our other brilliant people. But it is good to do the same thing Dr. McComas said we must do with our children, listen to them. I think that was Dr. McComas. It might have been Ms. Shea. Okay, I'm sorry. If we I'm like not getting to be on the same team, so we like to be, but, we like that. We're, we move as one. <laughs> but I, I know, but, but, but listening to the children and, and listening, not hearing them, but also paying attention to them, paying attention to the body language, paying attention to the clothes, paying attention to what they're saying, paying attention to all those things. And as the, inst the, the, the instructors, the educators, taking all of that and processing, am I giving, what am I giving this child? And even with group work, not a cookie cutter thing. So I can remember seeing teachers, we talked about this, um, at what is now Northwest Academy, but it was old court then, that if you have these children who are not readers or, or resist reading um, a novel or whatever, you break this down so some of the children who you know are weak, they might look at the cover and the book, The Cave, comes to my mind right away. Get them engaged in conversation sometime. And these, of course, are older children, but get them engaged 
And then, you know what happened all too often? They reached out to get the support so they could actually do some of the reading, while the others in that same group were reading and everybody doing some different things. So I'm saying reflect on what we can do, but that takes that takes that professional development, and I never come off of that. Never come off of it, because until we give our young people, all, uh, our teachers, our teachers those opportunities to, to delve into all of those aspects, they are busy trying to figure out what they're doing, let alone trying to figure out what the children are doing or why the children aren't learning. And we have to have those kinds of in place. So thank you to touch on all of those pieces to say they really okay. are connected. You're muted, I'm Cheryl. I, I'm finished. No, I was just saying I'm finished. Now. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate, um, I know we are pushing up on our time. Um, so I do want to be mindful of that. Um, but I just wanted to, I just, from what I understood is, um, that teaching is not a one size fits all for all students. And um, I think that's the biggest takeaway that I received from that. Um, I also, I wanted to know as far as the training goes, which you all spoke about for um, BCPS teachers, uh, the number up there said 1,393 teachers trained. Is that the number of BCPS teachers that are currently trained in cultural literacy proficiency? No, that number was actually referring to the letters training, which was about the science of reading. Um, but we do recognize the work that we need to do around cultural proficiency. And I would say that we've started at, so right now my whole team is reading coaching for equity. Um, so as they push into schools, that they're asking those questions and they're helping in that process. Um, I'm sorry, if I can interrupt you. What is coaching for equity? Is that a, is that a yeah, book it's a or book. is that a manual? <laughs> Yeah, it's a book study. Um, I mean, it's a book, and we're studying it. It's by Elena Aguilar. Um, but it, it really is helping us reflect on our own practices and the questions that we need to ask of the teachers. Okay. Um, and so we're working on our own cultural proficiency so then we can work in schools more effectively um, and ask the right questions so that we are serving all students well. Um, but okay, then we're so Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, my other question was what... Um cultural proficiency or literacy training other than uh, reading the book, is that optional or uh, uh, one? And then number two, what cultural literacy proficiency training are BCPS teachers currently receiving and how often is it administered? So I'll just speak for the, the I, I think that that's a two part question. So I'll speak for the, the coaching for equity is mandatory for everybody in my department. Um, so everybody that uh, is in that, that resource teacher K to 12 that's out working in schools is doing the study. To, we're doing it together. Um, additionally, we're doing the book uh, push out with all of our department chairs. So that touches um, every middle and high school. So there are pockets that we're doing, but I think that somebody else on the call might be better able to answer, like, what are we doing holistically for this system? Okay. Yeah, so, uh, Ms. Scott, I'll, I will try to add to that because it's a, it's really, I thank you for the question because you, you go straight to the heart of the matter, right? Because the reality is we, one, do need to provide a lot of the technical training that we see in letters. But most critically, in addition to the technical capacity we need to build in, in teachers, we need to build the cultural, the, the soft side, the human side, right? Because until I, as a white woman teacher, critically examine my own implicit bias and understand how I, uh, without um, uh, examined awareness, am setting up a, 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 a bias system in my classroom, my technical training will not overcome that. And so we as a system have been working to um, create systems to provide that across the district for several years now. We still have, in, in all genuineness, a heck of a lot of work to do around that. I know Dr. Williams has been working relentlessly, <laughs> relentlessly, and she's exhausted. Um, yeah, I know. And I, I would invite 
uh, Dr. Owens, if you would share some of the structures we have. Like we, we do training with principals and every school has an equity team whose job then is to go out and then cultivate and, and do professional based um, learning at the school level. Um, yep. I, so no, no worries, I, I'll jump right in. <laughs> So I want to kind of jump in on the end, Ms. Kraft's comment about the uh, the book Push Out that they are reading. That is the movie that we've been screening from the equity office for the past two weeks. So it is really good that we're like simpatico in that way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that I would offer outside of the larger point that there is equity training that is going on across the organization regularly um, that leaders can ensure that their staff members have access to. Um, one of the things I want to emphasize and what you've heard tonight is that the opportunity and Megan, sh Megan and I have like the hardest conversations. We're like sisters from another life because that's how that's how we go at it on these topics. Um, we have really hard conversations about the need to push harder. Um, so even in the framework that you all saw about the science of reading, culture is all through that. And if I don't understand that the way kids hear sounds, like as a black woman, I grew up hearing African vernacular English. So letter sounds sound like ABCs, but they sound like something different. And if teachers don't understand that Doug and dog are the same word, and both of them can be access points for my literacy, then they're missing it. And so there is there is the piece about the science that we need to understand, but science is never sufficient enough to interrupt systems of oppression, right? COVID should be impacting us all in the same ways, but right. it's not. So, so it is like the larger question of what is the nexus between what the literature would tell us about best practice and then those other things that we've been talking about, implicit bias, just cultural competency, anti-racism, all of that becomes um, equally as important uh, knowledge that teachers need to hold. So when Ms. Pastor says, I can never get off of professional development, we are simpatico because our organization has a ton of work around coming to understand other ways of being that the majority majority of our kids now observe that are not Eurocentrically oriented. And if I could just piggyback one more thing that I've learned from my sister, Lisa, is that we also have to be better that the training is not separate. So really, Ms. Scott, the, the end result has to be that every time I train on anything in my Department of Academics, it has to be done with a culturally responsive lens. So to your point, um, we have work to do, and, and um, Lisa's office has set up specific opportunities, but what she has really um, pushed on me and, and I with my team and pushed in a good way, is about, it is it is the work. It has to be a part of um, the academics. It's through content that we develop that cultural responsive instruction. Um, we have to be more explicit about it. I don't mean for a second to say, oh, it, it's, you know, it's just there because it's been far too, um, too much in the background. It has to be more um, overt and explicit, but it can't be devoid of the content. It, it has to be a part of the content. Um, and so well, just a real quick plug, we did do that in a more deliberate way this summer. We had our first department chair institute um, where we co-planned strands of development for our department chairs across the four core content areas. Um, so they had a content strand and they had an equity strand that was specific to culturally responsive instruction. So that's just another example of ways that we were working to bridge those areas of instruction. Well, and if I could to kind of marry another piece of brain science that it's important, right? But oftentimes it is left out of the space about reading and that is schema theory, right? So mm -hmm. I learn by connecting what is known to new information. So part of how we maximize, like how we make experiences really deep and rich for kids is we got to understand schematically how they connect ideas. And part of that is understanding their lived experience. So when Megan talked about, you know, we are asking more questions of students Students, and when they tell us we have to use that, that's how we accelerate by positing the learning in a way that is most accessible to them and then scaffolding where we would have them to go. If I may just add uh, two more comments to our conversation, I think it's really important for um, you in your role as board members who you, you interface all the time with parents and teachers and children that as we move forward with this, when we really have people dig in and do the, the, the self-examination that is truly, truly required. And we, we um, expose them to cultural, like um, the coaching that Ms. Kraft spoke to. People get in their feeling space. 
they get angry. People will say they're ma- they want me to feel bad about being white. And we have to ask them, why are you getting angry? Right. And, and I, I just ask that in your role as leaders, that you understand that that emotional journey is part of what has to happen. Right. It has to be part of at some point somebody has to say, you know, I, I'm, I'm feeling all sorts of some kind of way. And that that doesn't mean we should re- retreat. It means that we need to help them through that journey. And I just I just wanted to say that because as a white woman in this meeting, I can say it because I had to make that journey. I had to question how much of my white culture I unwittingly imposed on my students. I expected my black male students to come in and sit down and be quiet and do exactly what I thought they should do. Why? Because I'm imposing my white woman mindset, right? And then understanding what are their needs? How, how is it that I meet their needs? What is relevant to them? And then um, I'll just share one example because I think it's truly difficult for us as white women, white people to understand otherness. What does it feel like to be othered and to be that person who the culture is not addressing. Um, Many of you know, I've had different career experiences and throughout my career, both in the military and even as an educator in a high school culture, I have worked in very male dominated cultures. I have worked for men. I had one man, one time I worked for, and forgive me, gentlemen on the line, he was always using sports metaphor. I remember his, one of his favorites was a full court press. Well, I have to tell you, I didn't know what the heck he was talking about because I did not grow up in a household. My father hated professional sports. He thought it was uh, the biggest scam going. And so I grew up in a culture where I didn't, I had no idea what he was talking about. And finally, I had to say to him, could you please find something other than professional sports references? Because I don't know what you're saying to me. And, And that's just a mild example because I was an adult who could speak for myself. But if I were a child in that situation where a foreign dominant culture is imposing on me and I don't understand what the expectation is, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't address my need and understanding. And that is what happens to our children of color every single day. And not because our teachers have malintent, but because we have to truly help them along that journey. And I just ask that you're prepared in your role as community leaders to know that that journey is hard and it will get emotional. Um, but God, it's so worth it because our kids deserve it. So thank you for my testimonial. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Dr. McComas, for sharing that. I appreciate that. Um, that was uh, very informative and, um, and, and enlightening. And it's important that those experiences are shared and that helps us with our, our, our growth and our learning. And as board members, um, I feel that it's um, important that we hear that kind of feedback. And um, I I, I definitely uh, take that to heart. And so I I think that um, uh, that's important because I would like to hear more about, I guess, the bias training that our teachers are receiving and the calendar in which they receive it to learn how we as board members can support them in that and um, also how that can also help us with our growth and, and, and our training. So um, uh, I guess that would be Dr. Williams, because I, um, I know we as a board did do some bias training where we examined ourselves and our, and our own biases. And so I, I would just be um, curious um, about that, what the teachers in our, in our, in our full system, it's sort of like a holistic approach. So, um, if it would please the committee, what I can do for the next present, uh, the next committee meeting is bring a report on what the whole of equity training looks like across the organization, and give you some historical frame of what has happened, and quite frankly, where we are at present. Mm-hmm. That would work well for me, Miss um, Pastor. Your hand is raised. I didn't want to overlook you. Was it raised from previous, or did you have a question or comment? Oh. No, okay. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure um, I got everybody in because this is such a robust and important conversation. Mm-hmm. And um, I just really um, appreciate everybody being here and being present and um, the work that, that we are doing is, is, is very important for, for our children. 
So thank um, you so much for having us. Yes, thank you for coming. So um, I didn't want to move on. Were there were there any other questions or, or comments or anything? Okay, thank you. So um, I guess the third item um, on our agenda would be our next steps planning for our December meeting. And um, I wanted to make sure I, um, like I said, uh, uh, Dr. Williams, you're, you're going to bring us a um, uh, information about the training. Um, and um, Ms. Mack, was there something or anything you wanted to add? Because I wanted to make sure um, you had. I right. Um, I, again, I think it's critical for us as, if, excuse me, somebody might be coming in my house. Um, critical <laughs> for us as we move into budget season to have the information that best positions us to make the decisions that need to be made. And up to a point that Dr. McComish just made, you know, if, if in her, oh my gosh, sorry, in her professional opinion, we need to have more classes in the summer, then we need to advocate for that in the, in the budget. I mean, obviously she's going to advocate for it, but we need to know that she did so that we can support that so that we do give kids what they need. But to the granular level of information that I asked for in the inaugural meeting, you know, I want to be able to sit in a meeting in a budget meeting and say, no, you know, we don't need to do that for all schools, but we maybe should do this for these schools because of these reasons. So in answer to your question, I would like to have that data as soon as possible. So I will work with Mr. Burke to get that information for the next meeting. So those would be our two items. Ms. Pastor, did you... Um, have anything your hand is raised? Yes, my hand is raised. Thank you. Um, this is not necessarily for the next meeting, um, unless you can fit it in, but uh, we in, in the curriculum committee just had a wonderful presentation um, from the Office of Psychological Services, and they did a lot of talking about equity. And I think in light particularly of this conversation that it would be wonderful to have that presentation, maybe with the focus around equity um, so that we people are clear, because they said it a few times, uh, that it's not a, just about assessment and people think often that that's the main thing of what they do. And I think it was like 67 percent of what they do is not about assessment or should not be about. And I, I think that every time we have these conversations, it really does come back to taking a look at our children, taking a look at ourselves. So at some point, I would like um, to have a representative or representatives uh, from that office present. Thank you. Uh, sure, of course. Thank and I, you. I, if I could just really quickly just grab one moment because I know we're over time. Um, typically, I'm the person sitting at these meetings, so certainly you all associate the work that happens around equity with me. But I need you to know that the equity team is super talented. And the reason why you hear different offices talking about equity work is because the people that I work with try to touch every aspect of the organization to make sure everybody is using the lens. So I can't wait for you to get to meet these rock stars and hear about how we're working across the organization. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I can't wait to meet them either. Um, and I think also the last thing, and you may have already had this on there, is the, um, uh, the changes to policy 3111 that we discussed. Would that be something that would be able to be presented December's oh. meeting? Absolutely. I'll take care of that. Great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Perfect. Then. Um, were there any other comments or anything that anyone else had to add? Great. Okay. So um, that includes the agenda. Excuse for the me. Equity. Can we just say oh, happy yes. Thanksgiving? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, we happy won't see each other before Thanksgiving. So happy Thanksgiving. Sure have a good holiday, everybody. <laughs> Be safe. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. And that, with that, that includes the agenda for the Equity Committee. And um, I guess if there's any comments or any or no further business, then the meeting is adjourned. So, Thank, thank you. you. Good thank night. You. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye-bye.